this morning uh, going to share some things, some thoughts that I began on Wednesday night and I'll go over them and go into a little more detail. But I wanted to point some things out today that have just been thoughts and, and not uh, specifically related to my message, but just what I feel like is the body of Christ we need to be aware of. And uh, Galatians 2.20, we've been teaching on this for quite a while, and I would say by now, all of us have the understanding that we are crucified with Christ, but nevertheless we live, and that we are now living a life that is Christ living in us, that he is actually living through us. And with that thought in mind, let's pray and I'll continue on with this. Lord, we thank you that you are living your life through us. And we praise you for this. Lord, give us revelation this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What we can derive from this, the fact that Jesus is living through us, is that Christ, if we are in Christ and he is in us, he is now our very being. He is our very being. Well, what is the Holy Spirit then? The Holy Spirit is our doing. But our being, who I am, is Christ living in me, living through me. So if we want to see Jesus Christ on this earth today, how do we do that? Think about this. This is kind of a rhetorical, a rhetorical thing. How do I see Jesus Christ today on earth that's right I look at Sam and I see Jesus Christ I look at all of you who are in Christ that the life of Christ is living through you and that's how I experience Christ 2nd Corinthians 5 17 says therefore if any man be in Christ right Christ is our being he's a new creation old things passed away all things become new but the Apostle Paul said that I may know him. How do we know him? His word, of course. But we will know Christ through other people, specifically in the body of Christ. The church is his body. How are we going to know him apart from his body? It is the way he has manifested his, himself to us. And I'll, I've read this many times, and I've actually covered this before, but... It's just more of a revelation to me in Ephesians 1. And I'm going to read 19 through 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? What is the greatness of his power to us? Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to what? The church. The church. The manifestation of his body, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Many, 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 many times I've had Christians say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Well, it's, it's true. You can be saved without going to church. But you are missing out on the most important thing that God has given us, and that is knowing Christ through fallible, imperfect people. How many times do you hear people say, well, you know, I, I love God. It's just people I can't stand. And there's something to that because people are imperfect and fallible. But the great mystery of God is that he has chosen to express his love through imperfect vessels. That it is not about the imperfect vessel 
but about what fills that vessel. That Christ is in me and I am in him and he is my hope. So Wednesday night, um, kind of at the spur of the moment, I talked about faith because I felt like the Lord was really ministering to me some things about faith. And I'm just going to share a few thoughts. And we know that in Matthew 17, 20, we, we touched on this, that faith is a grain of mustard seed. If we have that much, what can we do? We can move mountains, right? We can, we can move mountains with just this little bit of faith. And Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us a definition of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And faith is what we would say is a bridge between the, thing, the natural things of this earth, my natural seeing, my natural sight. Faith is that bridge that I can see into the spiritual realm and that I enter into the spiritual realm with, of understanding and seeing through faith. It is like a bridge that bridges the two. The mustard seed, let's keep that in mind. And then another parable he put forth unto them saying, Matthew 13, 31 and 32. The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, it's tiny seed, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and become a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And I had some thoughts, I shared some thoughts on this in that we plant this little seed of faith and it grows into this big tree of faith. We become strong in faith as we feed ourselves the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, right? Hearing by the word. We listen to the word preached to us. Another reason why the body of Christ is so important. We listen to the word preached to us. Our faith begins to grow into this huge tree of faith with strength that the winds can blow and they don't blow this down. But there are the birds that have come and lodged in the branches. And interestingly enough, I, I never really understood what that was about. And, and I've come to a, a thought on this, if, that if you back up, and I'm cer it's certainly not original with me, this thought. If you read J. Vernon McGee, which I know Carl studies J. Vernon McGee, he explains this, and I, I believe he's right in this, because if you back up into verse 4 of this same chapter, the parable of the sower, and as he's sowing the seeds, in the field and guess what the birds come and devour them up as soon as they they fall down there and it doesn't sound very good about the birds coming to eat up the seed and it's not you know I grew up on a farm and my dad would plant these seeds and he would give me the hoe and I it was my job to cover them up and he could go a whole lot faster than what I could and I'm working with this, try, this hoe trying to cover the seeds before the animals would come or the birds would come and eat them up because they would if they were left uncovered. And the birds of the air in this context is something that's not good. And if we want more verification of this, in verse 19, when he begins to explain these, this parable to his disciples, instead of saying birds of the air, he says, the wicked one comes and devours the seed. And then when Mark records this, he says, Satan comes and snatches the seed away. And Luke says, the devil. So I don't think there's any doubt about what these birds are about. But faith is a seed that's given to each and every one of us. We can pray for more faith, 
But guess what? God has already given a measure of faith to each and every one. And it's what we do with that faith that makes all the difference in the world. Whether it will become a tree, a mighty strong tree, or whether it will be eaten up by the birds, or whether it will just be a weak little wilted plant. And we have some decisions that we can make on the increase of this faith. And I found it interesting as we read through the faith chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews, which is the faith chapter. It says, by faith, and it says all the mighty exploits of people. But let me give just a few examples. In verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation had his testimony, had this testimony that he pleased God. How old do you think Enoch was when this happened? Probably old, right? I would say. I mean, he lived many years and then was translated. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not yet seen, in verse 7, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Guess what? This happened when he was pretty old. And it's interesting as we continue to read through this that we see that most of the heroes of faith were in their later years. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. And was delivered a child when she was past age. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. How old was Sarah when this event of her faith, this thing that marked her faith? I think she was 90, right? Pre pretty old. I mean, at least by my standards. To, to me, 60 is old now. By faith, Abraham when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son when he was old. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And remember when he did this, the blessing? He was so old he couldn't even see that he could be deceived by Jacob into thinking he was Esau. By faith, Jacob, while he was dying, blessed both sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. And you see that the capstone events of the faith many times happened for people and that's not to say young people cannot have an abundance of faith but it just is interesting to see that the heroes of faith that it came to them after years of nurturing and growing the seed of faith when we see an enormous oak tree how often do we look at it and say ah you know what i planted that acorn last year it doesn't happen that way, right? It takes some time. It takes time for this to grow. It takes time for it to be nurtured and to receive the feeding of the Word of God to grow into this mighty tree of faith. So what do we know about faith? We only need a teeny-weeny little bit of it, right? This much. That's all we need. Okay? Okay. It's only this much. Why? Because it's going to grow. It's going to grow. If you've ever seen these breads that people make, that uh, they, they, they have the starter and, and this friendship bread, and you can get the little starter bit, and you just get a little bit of it, and you mix it with yours, and the next thing you know, yours, you're making it too, and you're making an abundance of bread. And that is the way the faith grows 
and increases. We only need the little starter piece. That's all we need. And it can grow into this enormous tree. Faith, here's some things. We have all that we need, but yet many times in our life there will be times that we think that we don't have enough. Faith doesn't see the obvious, but it takes hold of the unthinkable. Sometimes it defies logic, but yet it is not blind. The courageous love it, the weak shun it. The intellectuals question it, the simple go through with it. And let's be the simple that we will go through with faith. It's a choice, it's a gift, it's all that is needed to walk with the Lord. It sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, it receives the impossible, it's dead to doubts, it's dumb to discouragements and blind to impossibilities. It can move mountains, but without it, it's impossible to please God. Considering that faith this much can move a mountain, but without it, we absolutely cannot please God. You see how little it takes to please God. This much, a grain of mustard seed. Yes, that's what faith is. So what is faith? As we said, the definition right in the Bible. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Another version reads it this way. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So let's look a little bit at this. What does confidence and assurance mean? What, what do they mean? And confidence in the Greek is called hypostasis. Okay, and my Greek's terrible. You know, Chris complained about his. I guarantee you mine's worse. It actually means the underlying thing or more like a foundation. Okay? Confidence, it means the foundation of our faith. Faith is the foundation of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's upon this faith, upon this foundation, that our whole life is built. Without it, our Christian life will not be built in a way the doctrines that we stack together cannot be placed where they are without that element of faith. Another translation says, in faith, things hoped for become a reality. Oswald Chambers says, faith is deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. Typically, God will reveal later what we don't understand now and then the other word assurance he said it's the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see and the assurance is like a legal document or a deed when i go to, to my home how do i know that it is mine what assurance do i have if it be a begin to question whether i own it or your car, you pull out the title for your car and you can prove that you own it. Faith is that title or the deed to our salvation, to our eternal life. It's the assurance that we have. It's what we have to prove the things that are not seen. So I just wanted to share, and I'm not, it won't be much longer, I want to share three simple characteristics of this faith. And these are not original with me. I know it's hard to believe. Everything I teach is always original, right? No, 
Very little is. As a matter of fact, nothing is. If I don't learn it from somebody else, the Holy Spirit reveals it to me, and it's still not from me. But three simple characteristics. I thought these were good, so I'm gonna, I'll share them. Faith steps out and never backs out. Okay, it's kind of catchy, right? Faith steps out and never backs out. This is demonstrated in the story of Joshua in Joshua 3, 9. And I'll read this for you because it, and, and it's quite a bit of scripture here. But it's an interesting story about Joshua that I think that I would have really had some trouble with being obedient and in faith the way Joshua did. Joshua was a man of faith. He said, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 3. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, verse 9, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from you before you, drive out from before you, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Persites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. And behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe, one man. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. Okay, now this is Old English for need you to choose these 12 men. They will take the ark and they will step into the water of the Jordan River. And what I'm going to do, God's saying to them, is that I'm going to stop this water right here and you are going to have a dry place where you'll be standing. And it came to pass when the people removing from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people and as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan and the feet of the priests that bear the ark are dipped in the brim of the water for Jordan overflowed all its banks all the time of harvest. Now, to make this even more incredible, the river was overflowed. It was overflowing. It was a time of flooding. And what God's saying, I need you to take the ark and go and step into this flooded river. That's what I need for you to do. And most of us would probably say, ah, this is crazy. I'm not stepping in a flooded river. And the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city, Adam, that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until the people were passed clean over Jordan. So God commanded the people to go stand in a river. The river, the Jordan River was at flood stage. It was way high up. And I can say, I would have thought no one in their right mind would try this. But by faith, they had to go to the water and standing on the edge of the river, in faith, they had to step out. And they didn't take a step in and then back, back out. They stepped in and God revealed to them as the water moved, then you take another step and you take another step. And it's the way Peter walked on the water. You see, that wasn't about Peter's 
faith failing because Peter kind of gives a bad rap because he stepped out and he became fearful. But it's interesting that even when he was in fear, he had stepped out in faith that God reached out and saved him. Jesus asked Peter to come walking on the water. And as he sank, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And I don't believe that he was rebuking him. He said, you have a little faith. And you doubted. But why did you think that even though your faith was small that I would not save you and they that were in the ship came and worshipped him saying of truth thou art the son of God and Johnny Erickson taught us said this and I thought this was very pro profound she said faith isn't the ability to believe long and far into the mist misty future it's simply taking God at his word and taking the next step. Everyone know who Johnny Erickson Tata is? Is that she's a quadriplegic who has spent her life since the age of 17 in a wheelchair. And she's one of the most profound Christians that I've ever, that I've ever listened to. I've never met her in person. But considering that she can't even walk, that she makes this statement, faith isn't the ability to know everything that's going to come in the future. And that's what we want to know, right? I had a, I had a man tell me when COVID first hit and everything was going crazy. And you know, I had invited him to church and he goes, well, I want to go somewhere where they are prophesying and telling me what I need to do. In other words, I need to know the future. I need to know what's coming way down the road. I need to, to see what, what I, how to react to this stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you really don't need a church. You need a fortune teller because that's what you're wanting here. You're wanting to know everything that's going to happen. Johnny Erickson Tata is saying this. That is not what faith is. Faith is that when I take this step into the water and the water recedes, that I say, ha, ah, you know, Lord, you didn't fail me. And now my faith is stronger to take that next step. And that there will always be sufficient grace for me to take another step. And that is the way we live our lives as Christians, that we take one step at a time in faith, knowing that he will not fail us. The second thing about this faith that we know is that faith breaks out but never freaks out, right? Good example of this in Daniel 3, 16 through 18. Who would have more reason to freak out than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? So here they've set up this idol for them to worship and they say if you don't worship this idol we've got this furnace that we're heating up seven times hotter certain death and you'll be thrown in there if you do not worship this idol Shadrach Meshach and Abednego Daniel 3 16 answered and said unto the king O Nebuchadnezzar we're not careful to answer thee in this matter in other words We'll speak right up. We're not going to try to negotiate. We're not going to try to figure a less offensive way of saying it. We're just going to say it right out. We're not careful at all in how we're going to answer. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, 
Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I said faith breaks out and never freaks out. What, what do I mean break out? How easy would have it been for them to just blend in? All they would have had to do to not even be noticed at all was to bow down before this idol. And Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have even given them a second look. They would have never even been noticed. But they broke out of what were the normal norm, what was considered normal or the norm. They broke out of that. And they kept their heads. It's like there's nothing for us to freak out about. God is able to deliver us. But if not, be it known to thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Do you think maybe this was a stressful situation? But really we can say our answer to stress, our answer to depression, our answer to the impending doom that we may see coming our way is always going to be not just faith, but the one that our faith is placed in. There's many things that I can trust in but my trust and my assurance is in the Lord. You see, doubt always sees what is, what currently is. Doesn't see anything more than that. Doubt can see a pandemic that's going on around me. Doubt can see my financial ruin. Doubt can see my health but Ezekiel in 37 4 Ezekiel saw a valley full of dry bones no sign of life at all yet the word of the Lord says dry bones hear the word of the Lord and you know the rest of the story that the dry bones came to life this is what faith does for us God is in control of tomorrow he's in control of my work my family and because of who my faith is in I can rest assured and not freak out faith reaches out and never sits out this is the third one and this will be the final one faith is reaching out not sitting out. What's that saying? Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. What is lost? Everyone who has not come to faith in Jesus Christ. And Christ living in me, as Galatians 2.20 says, that the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. That if I allow Him to be my being that the Holy Spirit will move me into situations to reach out to others that I will not be satisfied to merely sit back and watch the world perish and watch those around me going to hell Matthew 14 31 Jesus reached out to Peter as he was sinking and he pulled him out and that's what he's saying for us to do that as he is living through us that we are to reach a handout to lift those up that are sinking you see our task the task is not to get God to do something that I think needs to be done. That if I have faith that I can manipulate God into doing what I want him to do. And that's what many, much of the teaching of faith is. That if God doesn't do what I expect or what I want, it's because I don't have enough faith. But I don't believe that 
is what faith really is. But it is to become aware of what God is doing and finding what my part is in that. Finding what his will is for me to participate in what he is doing in that he is living through me and living his will through us. God's in doing, indeed doing something and we can participate in faith. One thing I want us to keep in mind is that these heroes of faith in the Bible, as you take a close look at them, they didn't always get it right. Abraham was ready to give his wife away to one of the kings because he was afraid he would be killed. Was that the right thing to do? No, not at all. Moses struck a rock out of anger, misrepresented God. David committed adultery. Peter denied Jesus three times. All of the disciples, except one, deserted Jesus at the cross. Paul started out by killing Christians, but none of their mistakes and their wrongdoings stopped them from being used of God and having victorious lives. And in closing, I wanted to share an event by Hudson Taylor. And I had shared by a, a whole teaching on Hudson Taylor's book. But Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China. Young man, 19 years old when he got on a ship and left for China. The ship neared the channel between southern Malay Peninsula and the island of Sumatra. The captain said, there's no wind. The island people were heathen and cannibals. And I know that you believe in God. Can you pray for wind? Hudson Taylor said, yes, I will. But you must raise the sail. The captain said, that's ridiculous. People will call me crazy. Putting up a sail when there's no wind. But with insistence, he did. 45 minutes later, he came back, and Taylor, Hudson Taylor was still on his knees praying. And he said, okay, you can stop. We have more wind than we know what to do with. That's the kind of faith, this much faith. The faith that we would have to put our sail up when there's no wind. That we can see things as they will be in faith. Not merely from the flesh and what is now. And that's the kind of faith that God is looking at. It's the kind of faith that grows from a grain of mustard seed. That grows into a huge tree. Greater than all. That's the faith that he is calling us to have.